I'm going to start and just kind of talk about test format. Um, so your test six, it's going to cover U substitution, area between two curves, volumes of revolution, um, miscellaneous volume problems like the, you know, like this is the base and the cross sections are triangles or squares or circles or whatever. Um, integrating rational functions that we talked about a little bit on last Thursday. Um, we'll do that more today. And then improper integrals, which we're going to talk about today. Just kind of one little idea from that. But um, your, again, two parts for your test. The no calculator part it has seven questions. Three general U sub problems, just like things from 5.5. Five. Expect to see both single and double substitution problems. So like the double substitution might be like where you do the initial sub in the du and there's still like a leftover x or something and you have to rearrange the u to make a second substitution in, right? That's what I mean there. Um, there's going to be three rational function u sub problems that we saw in 7.4. So polynomial division, partial fraction decomposition, and inverse trig substitution cases. So we'll go through those again today. Um, and then one improper integral like you'd see in the 7.8. Part two is the calculator section, seven questions there also. Um, in each of these questions, I'm going to ask you to sketch a picture, set up the integral, and then solve with your calculator. So a picture, I just mean something in like the XY plane, where you can show me like your radius or heights or whatever, you know, like the pieces that you need for your formula. That's all I want to see in the picture. I don't need like a 3D rendering of anything. Um, but notice, solve with your calculator. It a lot of time. That's the intention. That's why I'm going to ask you to do seven problems here, is that I don't expect you to do any integrals by hand. Your calculator is going to do all of them for you. Um, so there'll be three areas between two curve problems, like in 6.1. Expect to have to do things like solving for the bounds of integration, integrating with respect to x or y, and then uh, dealing with functions that switch the function that's on top and bottom, or on the left or right if you're integrating with respect to x or y, respectively. So remember, you have to set those ones up a little bit different when they switch, right? Um, three volume of rotation problems, like in 6.2 and 6.3. Again, expect to have to solve for bounds of integration, integrate with respect to x or y, and use the washer, disk, or shell techniques. There's three problems. What do you think Mr. Gulick's going to do? Probably give you one that's most appropriately to done, you know, to do by each method, right? Um, and then there'll be one volume of solids with a geometric cross section like we saw in the multiple choice problems on 38 through 42 or the board problems when we did uh, 1, 2, and 10. Notice what do you not see on this list anywhere? No multiple choice. What else don't you see? No free response style question. These are all like I wrote these. They're all based on homework problems that you did in the text. Um, this is largely all skill stuff, not a lot of concept. It's just like, can you set up and do this kind of problem? I'm just going to cut through all the crapola and not try to hide it behind something else. It's just going to be like, here's an integral. Do the integral. Here's the volume of, you know, revolution. Find the, you know, find the volume or whatever. Pierce. Um, so, so Nope, you can graph it from your, you can do it on your calculator and put it in there. Um, again, make sure you're shading the shaded region, you know, like what is the, if you're revolving, like what's the shaded part that's, but yes, you can do that. Keep in mind though, if it's, if the variable's in terms of y, your calculator's a little less useful to you there, right? Like if it's x equals y squared minus one, it's a little bit of work to type that into your calculator versus just like, okay, this is just a parabola. It opens this way, you know, like, but yes, you have calculator. You can certainly use your calculator. 
just like when I say solving for the bounds of integration. If you have your calculator, what can you do there? Yeah, you can plug the two functions in and find the intersection, right? You don't have to do that algebraically. Use your calculator if you like. It's perfectly fine to do that. Chanel? Can I charge my calculator? Yeah, of course. You don't even have to ask. Just go plug it in. That's I keep them there for you guys because well, batteries die. Okay. Uh, everybody feel okay on test format? Okay. Like shouldn't be there's like nothing sneaky I'm trying to do here. Like these are just homework problems. Okay. Um all right. Let's go and do a little bit of 7.4. Um, I'm just going to kind of run through and do some more examples of these kinds of problems and talk about the different situations you might run yourself into and how to kind of tell the difference between like, hey, there's like a bunch of different things I can do. How do I know when I look at the problem which one to do? Everybody cool? All right. All right, so I take a look at something like this. My first hope is that I can just do this as a U sub problem. So typically the denominator would I'd want to choose as my U. If I take the derivative of that U, what do I get? 2x plus 3. Is that good news or bad news? That's great news, right? Because that is exactly what I need that's not my U, right? Everybody kind of see? So I can just make du then 2x plus 3 times dx, right? So my integral is just going to become 1 over u du. What's the antiderivative of 1 over u? Natural log of? Close. Absolute value u. And we should have one other thing here. Plus c. But we're not done yet, right? What do we still need to also do? Plug the u back in, right? So again, if it's an indefinite integral like this, it has to have that u plugged back in. If it's, if it's definite, you could have switched the bounds of integration and not had to sub the x's back in, but here you would have to. Everybody okay with that? Best case scenario, I can just do a u sub and everything works out. It's always my first try is to do something like that. Yes? Well, so like this is my du, right? And this is my u. So I have 1 over u du. It's like du over u. But if you yeah, sure, du over u, oh. if you want to call it that. du over u, which is the same thing as 1 over u du. I usually write it with the du just off to the side because it is less confusing to me. You see it now, Pierce? Okay. But yeah, it's because the u is in the denominator, why it's the u is in the denominator, right? What if instead, We have something like that. 
Now, again, my first hope is to you sub this, right? Is it going to work, though? Why not? Yeah. So we have the notice that they are different, right? That's a problem. Can I just subtract three from both sides to make it work? Can I just do something like that? Nope. Because if I multiply now both sides by dx, I get this, which isn't going to do nothing for me, right? Everybody cool? Why well, can't just get rid of that? So that's not going to work. So this is a case where I would do a partial fraction decomposition. Because if I look at the denominator, what do I notice? It is factorable. That's my key. So if I can't do u sub and my denominator is factorable, I'm thinking partial fraction decomposition. Well, how does x squared plus 4x plus 3 factor? Great, x plus 3 times x plus 1. Does it matter the order that I write it? Is that easy to do, the factoring? We're all good, we remember how to do that. Okay, multiplies to give you c and adds to give you b. Okay, I just want to double check. Like that's a, if you can't do that, we're in a lot of trouble. But my assumption is that's fine. Okay, so what we want to do then is we go, okay, I know that something over x plus 3 plus something else over x plus 1, if I add them together, I need that to give me 2x plus 1 over x plus 3 times x plus 1. Everybody agree that that's the setup? That's what I need to have happen? Mm -hmm. So I'm just going to solve this equation by clearing the fraction. So I'm just going to multiply both sides by x plus 3 times x plus 1. When I multiply to the first fraction, the x plus 3s cancel, giving me a times x plus 1. I multiply to the second fraction, the x plus 1s cancel, so that's b times x plus 3. And when I multiply to the third fraction, both x plus 3 and x plus 1 cancel, leaving me with just the numerator, 2x plus 1. I then am going to distribute everything out. That's supposed to be a b. And I know that when I combine my like terms, I multiply my or add my x's together, that ax plus bx has to give me 2x. So a plus b has to equal 2. And when I add my constants together, a plus 3b has to give me 1. So there's my system. Everybody's okay here? Now this kind of problem will appear on the no calculator section. To solve this system, we should substitution, substitution or elimination, either is appropriate. I would do elimination here. If you wanna graph this, I would pass on that, but you could. So let's just say we take equation one and equation two and we subtract them, yeah? So a minus a is nothing, b minus 3b is 2b, and 2 minus 1 is 1. So what's b have to be? Negative 1 half. So what does a have to be then? 2 and a half, or I'll write as 5 over 2, doesn't really matter. You can use a decimal there if you wanted to. Is everybody good with how we got the 2 and a half? Okay, so what this says then is that my integral of 
f prime dx I can write as a was over x plus 3. Okay. So I have a over x plus 3 plus b over x plus 1 dx. Braden. So whatever you, however you wrote it here is how it has to stay, right? A has to be over x plus 3 if we wrote our equation A over x plus 3. Would it have mattered if I wrote it as A over x plus 1 at the start? No, I'll end up with the same answers, but they're, you know, yeah, like it won't matter, but like you have to be consistent. Whatever you pick A over has to stay. Everybody cool? Okay, let's go back and look at this integral. So I'm going to do this. Yes, sir. I'm going to do each fraction separately, right? How do I do the first fraction? Yeah, it's definitely a u sub. But it's like the easiest u sub ever, right? And the second one, still same thing, right? I'm going to use v's just so that, you know, Everybody's good? So when we do that, I'm just going to go straight to the antiderivatives. So I have 5 over 2, natural log, absolute value of u, plus negative 1 half, natural log, absolute value of v, well, that's embarrassing, plus c. And that's our final. Yep, there's another way. Uh, the next, there's two more ways actually, or two more things that could you could might be able to do with these actually. But yes. Why haven't you like the d u is it just d u d x is it just like one? Would it also impact the other? No. It's just the one fraction you're working in. Yeah. So if this was like a 2x down here and you had to do like, you know, du over 2, it would just like knock the 2 out of there, right? And everything else would just kind of run through and be the same. <laughs> I'm be honest with you, Braden. I wouldn't give you one here because just because the factoring is a hassle. Where if the leading coefficient isn't one, the factoring is a hassle, right? So just I'd be honest with you, I wouldn't do that just because if in a time test, I don't want you to spend a bunch of time like trying to factor something that's a pain in the butt to factor, or that you can't look at and instantly factor like in a ten seconds, you know. All right. Um, what if we have something that looks like this? Um, let me see. What do you notice here? The degree is bigger in the numerator. Yes, means we should be doing polynomial division here. Now, there's two ways to do polynomial division, right? Long division and synthetic division. When can you use synthetic division? So the denominator needs to be degree one and leading coefficient one, which is what we have. So we can do a synthetic division here. So let's do that because it's quite a bit easier. What goes on the outside? Emma. Well, if we're doing synthetic, though. 
You it is one. There you go. Oh, maybe it was Talika that said it. My apologies, Eva. Yeah. Somebody back, one of the somebody, one of the girls back here said it. What to do? Yes, we're going to take the denominator, set it equal to zero, and whatever you get is goes on the outside. And then what goes on the inside now? Um, what are what are the numbers? One, negative two, negative zero, seven. Why this zero? Oh, because it's x plus one. Yeah, there's no x term. Don't forget, don't forget the place holders. Will I do that to you? Yes. Yes, absolutely. What's what's the worst placeholder to get? Is if I have one like this. If there's an X at the end, what do you have to remember? A zero, zero. a zero at the end, which is, that's the one that's most likely to be forgotten. Just to remind you guys, right? All right. Shh. How do we do this synthetic division from here? We got it set up. Now we got to do it. Good. One times one. And then add down, right? And we just kind of continue that pattern. Okay, now what do these numbers at the end give us? It's x squared x minus, x minus x minus 1 and its remainder. So it's the coefficient on your x squared, the coefficient on your x, the coefficient on your constant, and then a remainder. Usually I start from the right and read to the left because it's remainder, and then degree zero, degree one, degree two, and just however number, I just keep going up one degree. Everybody's okay? So what we can say then is that the integral of f prime is gonna be the integral of one x squared minus x minus one plus six over the divisor Is everybody okay with how I've done that? And now we can just do this term by term, right? What's the antiderivative of x squared? X squared. Good. And the antiderivative of x? x squared. Antiderivative of 1? Okay. Antiderivative of 6 over x minus 1? So 6, natural log, absolute value, x minus 1. And then plus c. Joy. So I multiplied those two together, Yeah. wrote the number there, and then add down. Oh, yeah. Thank you. And then I just keep repeating that process. Yeah. Okay. Does that feel okay? That jogs our memory on the division piece? You have to practice a couple, but it shouldn't be too many to practice before you're like, yo, I got this. Right? Because they're. I just don't know how to do the regular one. Yeah. I, I wouldn't worry about it because, again, Mr. Kulik tried to design something that just like. Try not to make it take a million years. Right? All right. Um, oops, I forgot to give this a name. Well, if we have something that looks like this, what do you notice right away? Bottom degree is bigger, sure. Can I use sub this? No. No, right? Because I'm going to get a 2x, and there's not another x anywhere. Okay, so I can't use sub that. Um, can I partial fraction decomposition it? No. Why not? That doesn't matter. 
it's not factorable. Yeah. So what am I to do? Well, the idea here is I'm going to try to do another u substitution, but I'm going to try to use that. Just relax. I'm going to try to make it as good, as easy as we possibly can. Okay? Easy as we possibly can. All right, so that's our goal. That's what I'm going to try to use. So what I want to do is, like, a completing the square. with this. So what number needs to be there for me to complete the square? Do you remember how to figure that out? B over 2A. It's b over 2a squared. Oh. Wait, so 2 over 2 is 1. So that should be a 1, right? Mm -hmm. B is 2. A is 1. So 2 divided by 2 squared is 1. And now I have a plus 2 right here, right? I have 1, so what else needs to be there? 1, right? Everybody's good? Now this part right there is a perfect square. How does that factor? X plus one times X plus one, but that's not how I'm going to write it. Yeah, that's how I'm going to write it. Is everybody good? So we have, that's what I needed. What's my U going to be? Mm -hmm. So du should just be dx. Everybody feel good? And now the antiderivative of this is just tangent inverse. And I'm going to put my U back in. Is that okay? Not as bad as you thought, right, Talika? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, this is like the best case scenario kind of version of this because this thing, the leftovers when we did our completing the square, was a one. What happens if it's not so neat? What if that leftovers was not just one? Let's do make that a minus. Say we have that. Again, first thing you notice is denominator is not factorable, right? So we're going to do that same trig sub or trig inverse with a u sub is our goal. So when we do our completing the square, what should be there? Four. Do we agree? Again, it's b over two a squared. So that should be 4. And then what's our leftovers then? Four. Also 4, right? Because 4 plus 4 is 8. <laughs> I don't know. You take away the plus sign, it's not Right? It just still has to be equal. So whatever we find out what we needed, whatever the leftovers are, is just whatever gets us back to the original C. Does that make sense? Now, what's the bad news here? It's not one. It's not one. Yeah. 
That's great. How are we going to algebra our way out of that? Factor of four out of the denominator. You could do that. What I prefer, let's just multiply the top and bottom by one fourth. I think algebraically this makes it a little easier to keep track of everything. So, oops. So the numerator, I'm going to have negative one-half, sure. The denominator, I'm going to have one-fourth, x minus two squared plus one. Now it's one, but we created a new problem. What's the new problem? Well, if I do, I'm back where I started. Here's the trick. Here's the trick. Can I write one fourth as something squared? One half squared. Everybody okay there? Yeah. Right? This is why we're showing it to you. So that this becomes like, oh, I've seen this trick before. Since those exponents are both squared, guess what I can do? Yeah, multiply the bases together. Excellent. You guys okay with that concept? Yeah. Right? This is the same idea as like, right? We're just using it going that direction. Algebra 2 again. Now, we're ready to do our u sub, right? So what's du dx here going to be? <laughs> this should be like a one second question. What if we write it this way? So, so du should be 1 half dx. Is everybody okay? So much of what we're doing, particularly in this second half of the course, is looking at what we're trying to integrate. How can I do this easily? Right? Can I rewrite this in a way that makes the integration or differentiation really really easy for me that is most of what your first year calculus is about is like how good are my algebra skills how sneaky am i that i can remember or figure out a way to rearrange this so that it's like easy to do that's what it's about we're all just changing forms to make the calculus easy all right uh let's continue on here so we're going to have a negative 1 out front, 1 over u squared plus 1 du. So we have negative tan inverse of x minus 2 over 2 plus c. Right. Joey, I took, oh. that went away in the substitution, so I'm left with just the negative. Yep. Emma, have a nice day. You miss all the good stuff from 7.8. Did you guys feel a bit better about these rational? Do you better about like picking which one to do when? Yeah. Great. Will we always be in like for this class will we always be using like in the Yeah. 
I wouldn't give you one with the uh, what was the other one that they we list here? This one just stinks. Trying to do a sine inverse here. Because if you have to do the same thing now, you have to stick it like you have to multiply it into the square root, which is it just it's like a hassle. I think it's it's like the same idea. But yeah. <laughs> Looks like something for sure. All right. Uh, let's talk improper integrals next day. Eh? That was all seven four. So with this idea of an improper integral, this is not necessarily a new idea. We're just stapling on to what we already know how to do with integration. So it's not like a big conceptual new thing, okay? That'd be bad. This is an example of an improper integral. What do you notice here that's unusual? An infinity in your bounds. That's what makes an improper integral. Everybody's okay with that? Yes. Easy to identify what it is, right? Now remember, an integral is talking about the area under a curve, right? So if we talk about the graph of 1 over x squared, kind of looks like that. If this is 1 here, we're talking about that area, right? How much, is that, well, how much area does that look like? Kind of looks infinite, doesn't it? Because that keeps on going forever. Guess what? It's not infinite. Sometimes it is. Sometimes it's not. Well, we have to do the integration. Yeah, we have to do the math. All right. So we can't plug in infinity in like a problem. But what we can do is we can rewrite this as a limit. So I'm going to introduce like a dummy variable, t, and just rewrite it like that. So I've gone and taken our improper integral and changed it into a limit. I can now just do this like I would any definite integral and just evaluate the limit of my answer. Right? This is in the no calculator section. So let's start. We're going to be doing an indefinite integral here. I'm sorry, a definite integral here, excuse me. So how do I do the integral uh, or the antiderivative of 1 over x squared? Sure, absolutely. Think about that as x to the negative 2. over negative 1. Not plus C because it's definite. Right? I have bounds. Everybody's okay? And then I can plug in, right? So I'm going to think about this instead as uh, T is just my bound. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's, that's the bound, right? Um, so I'm going to think about neg x to the negative 1 over negative 1 is negative 1 over x. Oh, yeah. Is everybody okay with that? Or 1 over negative x if you want. I don't like it that. Mm -hmm. I'd rather write it the way I have it. So I'm going to have negative 1 over t minus negative 1 over 1. 
Everybody feel okay there? That's just me doing a definite integral. I'm going to clean up inside those parentheses there a little bit. I'm just going to write that as 1 minus 1 over t. Doesn't really matter if you want to do that. I like doing it just to get clean up some of the negatives in there, right? Well, that's one, right? Well, I thought about x to the negative one over negative one is negative one over x. Mm -hmm. And then one for x. I just did a definite integral, right? We okay? Yeah. All right. Now all I have to do is the limit. So it's the limit as t approaches infinity of 1. No. Nope. 1. Yes. The limit of a constant is always the constant. What's the limit as t approaches infinity of 1 over t? It is not negative infinity. It's not positive infinity. Talika's right. It's zero. Well, good job, Ava. Okay. The way to think about this is if you have one over a huge number, that's getting really close to zero, right? Like one half is bigger than one third, which is bigger than one fourth, which is bigger than one fifth, as the denominator keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. The fraction keeps getting smaller and smaller and smaller. So my answer here is just one. Does that feel okay? Not bad, right? It's the same thing we've been doing, just we tack the limit onto it. Okay, not a big deal. Um, and this, again, perfectly doable with no calculator, right? Nothing confusing or nothing super tricky going on there. Um, let's do another one before we kind of call her a day, huh? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's like, there's a lot more that we could do with improper integrals, but to be honest with you, this is not an AB calc what topic it's a BC one but like in your first year or two of calc you will absolutely be doing this so I feel like I should address it now even if it's just like we're dipping our toe in a little bit we're not doing heavy with this huh no I mean I think that from what I recall like 60 or 70 percent of the A, B, and B, C questions are the same. Are you going to get a pass this one? Yeah. Um, there's like two significant topics that we will not even touch on that are on there. And like those topics have like multiple pieces to it. Does BC just cover more like topics? Is it just like way faster too? Uh, well, some some schools will offer A, B as a junior and then B, C as a senior. Yeah. And in that case, typically you do like first semester is just a review of A, B topics. And second semester is here's these two new things and then get ready for the test. Yeah. That's a, yeah. It's probably about right. All That's about right. Yeah. Um, I would have said one and a half. It just kind of depends on where you're doing. It. Yeah. Just kind of depends on where you're taking it. Um, and how much of your teacher does like shells and improper integrals and integrals by part. You know, like some of these things we're going to do. We're not going to do like a ton of, but we're going to like see it. So it's not foreign to you. We won't do any sequence and series stuff, and that's like your second half of Calc 2.
And that's a big piece of the VC topics. Yes. Um, this is kind of just a general question, but mm -hmm. how far in calculus can like engineering majors go? Pretty far. Uh, you'll probably do calc oh, one, two, three, oh, and then you'll do DFEQ differential equations. Oh, we're gonna oh, we're gonna do that here. That's like A B topic. Now it's more complicated in the a course full of there's like lots of methods. Um, but these are these are all like Kelp three is hard. Kelp three is hard. Like there's some legitimately hard stuff in Kelp three. Um, but it's really like the back half of it. The front half isn't bad. Proved it. Did proofs. That's what you. If you take, if you're a math major. You'll take like a real analysis course, which is like the proof version of calculus. Uh, like you prove like what in like it's proving things about the real numbers, which is the foundation of calculus, like the real analysis. Analysis is calculus. But you like you construct like what an integral really is from first principles. You know, like you can, because like you can do integration over non continuous functions, and like your definition should be structured in such a way that, like, even if you have something that's like infinitely discontinuous, you can still do an integral on it. So, like, the anti derivative thing that we do is effective, but like. Your functions don't have to be continuous and have like obvious antiderivatives. Like, what do you do then? And it goes back to like this area under the curve idea. But that's the kind of stuff you'll do. Like, you'll prove like the mean value theorem and the intermediate value theorem. You'll do it like from first principles. You'll develop like what does an integral really mean? Um, you know, like more than what we do here. But so, 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 so that's a hard course. That's a hard course. Um, all right. What's so let's. Your favorite math class that you like? Oh yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I like. I really like number theory. What's that? So like. Scary. No, it's like. It is. The the like the really kind of cool thing about that course is it connects all these ideas of like pre-algebra to like these algebraic structures. So like the idea of like, what does a greatest common divisor look like or a least common multiple? Like how would you find a least common multiple? How do you prove that something is a least common multiple? Um, and you can and you can do those sorts of calculations even for things that are not numbers, like you do it for a polynomial. Um, and like most of your foundations for like, um, like digital communications are built in from the foundations of that, like, discipline. So like the encryption you use to like keep your messages private is based on these kind of, well, one set of encryptions is based on these number theory problems. Well, it's, it's a cool course. Um, anyways, here we go. What do you notice here that's different than the previous one? Two infinities, first order of business. We can't do an improper integral with two infinities. So we're not doing a substitution. We're just going to do this. And just break it into two separate integrals. Yeah. Now, is there anything magical that about why split it at zero? It's an easy number when I do the definite integral. Could I view 7? Yes. Square root of 5? Yes. Pi? Yes. 
Negative 19. Yeah, yeah. I, could, I could do all those things, but like Talika is correct. The question is, why would you want to do that? Just use zero. Okay. All right. Um, now we need to turn this into each of these into limit problems. So limit as t approaches negative infinity of the integral from t to 0, 1 over x squared dx, plus limit as t goes to positive infinity, integral from 0 to t, 1 over 1 plus x squared dx. If you're confused by two different t's, you can use a different letter in one limit and a different letter, no, a different letter in the other limit. Right, if you don't like having two sets of t's there, you know, you can do t and u, you can do whatever, p, q, pick your favorite letter, probably not x. All right. Everybody's okay here? Yes. Now let's do our antiderivative. What is the antiderivative of 1 over x, or 1 over 1 plus x squared? tan inverse x from t to 0 so far so good okay now let's finish off our definite integral Everybody okay with how I've how we've gotten to here? All right. Who knows what tan inverse of zero is? Okay. So let's let's figure out how to do that because potentially this would have landed on the no calculator section. So let's start with just the graph of tangent. What's the graph of tangent? Just one period of the graph of tangent. Looks like this one, right? Everybody's okay? You remember that? Yeah. Now, does this thing have any special key feature here? Uh, asymptotes. Great. Where are those asymptotes at? Negative one one. Okay. Well, let's remember what is tangent in terms of sine and cosine? Sine over cosine. Sine over cosine. So the asymptote should be when what is equal to zero, sine or cosine? Cosine, the denominator, right? When is cosine equal to zero? Pi over two and three pi over two. So every pi units, it's going to be zero, right? Everybody agree? So this one over here should be pi units backwards. So negative pi over two. Everybody agree? Okay. To change a function into its inverse, what do we do? We swap the x's and y's, right? So the vertical asymptote, x equals negative pi over 2, turns into the horizontal asymptote, y equals negative pi over 2. And then, obviously, then the vertical asymptote x equals pi over 2 turns into the horizontal asymptote y equals pi over 2. Everybody agree with that? Okay. If I look at this arrow, yes, certainly. That's kind of like the point negative pi over 2, negative infinity, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
So over here, that should be negative infinity, negative pi over 2. So I know that I'm, part of my graph is going to look like that. Everybody okay with that? What's that part of my graph like? Pi over 2, positive infinity. So over here, that's going to be positive infinity, pi over 2. Right? And then this guy right here is... 0, 0, so that's still going to be 0, 0. Everybody feel okay? All right. Now, why did I want this picture? I'm going to use that to get my limits. So tan of tan inverse of 0 we know is just 0. What's tan inverse or the limit as t approaches negative infinity of tan inverse? Negative pi over 2. And what's the limit as t approaches positive infinity of tan inverse t? positive pi over 2. Oops. And then again, tan inverse of 0 is still 0. So what do I get here? I get pi. What do you mean? Is everybody OK there? Now really, what was the worst part about that? It was dealing with the limit, right? because that was one where maybe we had to construct a graph to deal with it. But was doable, right? All we needed to remember was like some information about tangent and we're able to construct the graph at tangent inverse using like just what we remembered from algebra two and pre-calculus and trigonometry, previous classes, which ideally are still there rattling around somewhere back with Taylor Swift lyrics and obscure basketball trivia and whatever else might be, you know, hanging out back there. Um, this is really as much as I want to do with the improper integrals. This is the idea, is I just want you to be able to deal with an integral with some infinities in it. It's not a big deal otherwise, right? All right, so, nope, there's not more. I'm just writing down some homework stuff. That was all of 7.8 we're going to do. Is there more in 7.8? Sure, but that's the part that I want you to know. It's just to, how to deal with those improper integrals, like the most basic set of improper integrals. Yes, sir. Can we go over um, 39.41.6.3? Yeah, we should have time to do that. Uh, that's my plan. It's some kind of review thing. I haven't written anything yet. You said 39 and 41? All right.
All right, so let's start by generating a picture. So if x is 0, y could have been 1 or negative 1, right? Um, if x is 1, y would be the square root of 2 or negative square root 2. Um, if x is negative 1, y would also be, actually I'll just do that, be the same things, right? So what we're getting is something that kind of looks like this. It's okay there? And then we have the line y equals 2. So that's like our shaded region. And we're rotating about the x-axis. Oops. I would be doing this as a washer. Yup, Chanel's right. So that's like my R inner. That's like my R outer. Feel good so far? So my R inner is going to be a Y value. So that should be Oops. We have y squared minus x squared equals 1, or y squared equals 1 plus x squared, or y equals plus or minus square root 1 plus x squared. But which one of those do I want, the plus or the minus? The plus. Okay, and then our outer, well that's easy, that's just two. So our volume should be the integral of pi r outer squared minus r inner squared dx. We just now need the bounds of integration, right? So that should be there. So if y equals 2, I have 4 minus x squared equals 1. So I have plus or minus the square root of 3. And at that point, you could type this into your calculator. If you had to do it by hand, what could you do here to make your life a little easier? You could do that. Right? Since it's symmetric about the y-axis, you can just, instead of going from you know, that makes life a little bit easier, but you don't need to do that. Your calculator can get you the same answer one way or the other. Does that feel okay, Braid? Getting the graph out of that was going to be the hardest part, I think. And you don't need me to do anything past that, right? Just like the setup, you're good? Okay. I guess I should probably go back and check that at some point here before I move on just to make sure I didn't boo-boo anything, but it felt pretty good. You know? 
this is only the third time I've taught this course, so. Oh, yep, yep. Yes. I can, but Brayden also wanted to do 41. That's okay. All right. Uh, so we have y, x squared plus y minus 1 squared equals 1. And we're doing this about the y-axis. This, I know what the graph looks like right away. Who else knows what this looks, what the graph of this is going to be? It is a circle. Where is the center of the circle at? Zero, zero, one. Zero, one. Right, because it's, yeah, oh, okay. Right, and what's the radius on this going to be? One. And we're rotating here. Yep. Yeah, I think in all reality, you could probably just do and be done with it. But like, let's do it the calculus way, eh? Just for grins. This should be a washer, right? Because this is convex. So that's the radius. So x would be 1 minus y minus 1 squared, square rooted. And we'll just take the positive side of it, right? Instead of, I mean, there's a plus or minus here, but I'm just going to drop it. I think that ought to do it. Let's just double check again. I did all these problems at one point, but again, that was like a year and a half ago, probably. Oh, you know what? That was supposed to be dy. But yes. Yeah, that's correct. Otherwise. And again, on the test or whatever, like... That's your setup. You don't have to like simplify further than that. Just get it to the point where you can get into your calculator and you're good. Um, so like on a problem like one of these, you know, like be like one point for your picture, one point for the method, like one point to make sure you have the right variable of integration, whether you're dy, dx, you know, like a point for the bounds, maybe one to two points for the setup, and then like one point for the answer. You know, like that's kind of the where I would be doling out the partial credit. So like there's lots of stuff you can get pieces of. Uh, well, it's disk is the integral of 
you know, like a to b, pi, r squared, d whatever, or uh, let's just say dr, where r is your radius function. Washer is integral a to b pi r outer oops, squared minus r inner squared dr. And then shell would be like again a to b 2 pi r and then h. Um, but this is like, you know, where those are both r and n, h are both functions of the same variable. So the classic example is something like this, because like your r inner and your r outer are on the same function. If that's not easy to solve, like if this is like y equals, you know, uh, say like 2x squared minus x cubed. Can I write that in terms of x easily? I have no idea how to do that. It'd be really terrible. Um, so that's a shell, is when the r outer and r, in, r inner seem not obvious on how to separate them. Now, like this previous problem, you could have done with a shell, but the r outer and r, r inner are so easy to come up with. Like, I wouldn't bother, right? Like, easy to get them. You know what I'm saying? Or you could do the, the you know, the disk one here that we just did. Why did I write washer? I'm crazy here. It's a disk that we did. Um, you could do that with a shell if you wanted to, but again, like, seems like an awful lot of work for something that's like, dude, that's just a sphere. That's just over there. <laughs> um, and that should be cubed, not squared, obviously. I just typoed that. Um, Chanel, you had one here that you wanted to ask about? Yeah, for three. Three. Oops, I don't know where that just put that. All right, let's sketch a little picture. Uh, cube root of x looks like this. Let's say this is x equals 1. This is the point 1, 1. So there's my shaded region, right? Um, so it wants to do shells, so I would take like my shells like that, where that's going to be radius, which is just x, and height, which is just going to be y. So x is going from 0 to, oh, it didn't tell me. Oh, it said rotate about the y-axis. Great. Okay. So going from 0 to 1. And then we're going to have 2 pi, and my r is x. h, which is y, which is cube root x, dx. Calculator at that point. Did you also use the washer method on this? Okay. Uh, uh, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, it would not be hard to do that. Okay, so is is the main difference between like shell and washer just like this one's just using like height and radius, the other one isn't? 
Uh, it's just the formula is the difference. They're gonna, they both accomplish the same thing. It's just that some problems are like kind of intractable as a, as a washer problem or a shell problem. So it's, you wanna have like both methods. Absolutely. Yeah. Oops. Except we're going to be doing. Yeah, okay. So that's. That should be Y cubed. So why do you have a one cube when you're doing the washer method? Because this is an x value. Okay. So I need that equation in terms of x. Oh, okay. that feel okay? What did I do here, Mr. Kulik? Quit being a bozo. It's supposed to be a DY out there, everybody. So is it one minus one uh, y and then square? Because like, is it like the outer one is like which one? Is it just one? So our outer always the same. Our inner the curve. So our outer is just one, like mm -hmm. the new, and then our inner would just be the the x. Mm -hmm. What do you guys think? What do you mean? The um, method we're using will just make equations. Uh, it makes it easier for me to check it if you tell me what you are trying to do. Because even if you goof up the formula, if you've got the correct, like you're trying to do the right thing and you goof up the formula, that would help. If you goof up the name and do the right formula, I don't, I won't care. But I would tell you if you tell try to tell me the name and you know the name and you goof up the formula a little bit, like that's easier for me to be like, okay, I see what they are trying to do then. Versus like, what the heck are they trying to do here? You know, so just about like the partial credit of it. If you tell me you doing washers and you accidentally did a disc, you know, like, okay, well you have it's the correct work, like that's fine. I'm not too worried about you knowing the names, but if you know the names, that can help you with the partial credit. That's what I would tell you. Does that feel okay? Yeah. All right. How are we feeling about stuff? The U sub you feel okay with? Yeah. Oh. Is everything except this, this U sub? I'm good with U sub. I'm not good with disk and washer. The disk and washer? Yeah. I'm just not ready for Friday. Mr. Kulik, like, can we do it like I do the U sub and he does the disk washer and we get like a hundred? Yeah. That'd be cool if you could, right?